Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And what, uh, what I'd like to do with our time this morning is take you on a little bit of a journey, uh, a journey that began a little over a year ago when Watson Technology debuted on a U.S. game show called Jeopardy. About once every 10 years or so, IBM takes on a grand challenge. Many of you will remember uh, the last grand challenge that IBM took on, which was the chess playing computer against uh, Gary Kasparov, uh, in which it defeated the Grand Master. Similar to that, Watson was a grand challenge. We started uh, and set out on a journey to do something that had never been done before. Have a computer compete in natural language in a situation where a massive amount of data had to be ingested, understood, and quick responses had to be applied. In fact, in the case of Jeopardy, about 200 million pages of data uh, was being synthesized and analyzed in a matter of about three seconds. And three seconds was critical, because that's how long it took for the game show host to read the question uh, that the contestants, Watson, had to respond to. You couldn't buzz in until that question was read. So this was a system built for a purpose, right, to demonstrate something that involved both natural language, machine learning, and the ability to ingest what now is called big data. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, Watson, the technology, how it works, uh, its practical applications, how it's being put to work, and ultimately where we see Watson uh, going in the commercial world. There is no question when you look at uh, where we are today, the world is becoming far more instrumented, interconnected, and intelligent. And in fact, imagine walking out of an airport in Singapore or Stockholm and getting into a cab and have that cab driver understand the optimal route to your destination. What would come of that? Well, first, you'd get there more efficiently. You'd save money. That particular cab would get another fare and make more money. It'd be more efficient, so we'd reduce carbon emission as well as fuel consumption. That's exactly what's happening with the use of information and analytics today in those cities. They're using information to optimize transformation and routing. Just the other day, I realized how interconnected our world had become. I had gone to the mailbox, and yes, it was a piece of postal mail that I had gotten from the government. And I looked at it, and at first I panicked. It was a traffic violation. So it was a fine. And then I realized the good news, it was my wife. Now, when I looked at it, I realized what had happened. She had violated a, 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 a red light ordinance, uh, and it captured her on a camera. And that camera matched the license plate right, to the motor vehicle records, sent me this citation in the mail. I could literally click on the link in the citation, see the actual violation occurring, and then once I paid, it would automatically reconcile and close out that record. A tremendous amount of sophistication. In fact, over one trillion connected devices exist today in the world. That's a phenomenal amount of information that's being generated. And in fact, 2.5 quintillion bytes of data is created every single day. Now, I had a hard time wrapping my mind around what is exactly 2.5 quintillion bytes. So I poked around, did a little research, and it equates to about uh, 240 newspapers being delivered every single day to every single individual, man, woman, and child on the planet. Imagine trying to consume, ingest, and understand that amount of information. 90% of the world's data has been created in the last two years. Since the beginning of time, 90% in the last two years, 80% of that data is unstructured. It's in formats that don't confine or don't uh, uh, align uh, to standard computer thinking and technology. It's not in rows and columns, not neatly, neatly organized, right? It's in freeform text, it's in pictures, uh, it's in blogs, it's in tweets. And the systems that are out there were not designed around the use of unstructured information. They weren't designed to deal with the chaos of, of big data. Uh, and to gain insights from that information. And so the systems that are running businesses today do a phenomenal job in traditional sense of applications and how they put it to work, and yet organizations still report they don't have the information they need. You know, one in three executives say they can't get to the information, one in two say they don't even have it. And yet CIOs clearly understand the importance of this and it's a top priority for their organization to deal with big data, to deal with analytics, and we're going to see in just a second that analytically, analytically driven organizations can only just better perform. And it's not just the volume of data. Although the volume of data is exceptionally impressive, 12 terabytes of tweets every single day are created. 
but it's also the velocity, the rate at which information is coming at us and being presented. On the New York Stock Exchange alone, five million trades occur every 60 seconds. That's one single trade exchange. Now imagine calling your broker and asking a question about a particular stock or a particular investment. It's not just the trading volume that they have to contend with. It's the research, it's the news, it's all the data that ultimately will influence that particular investment choice. How do they sort through? How do they get their arms around that? So you got volume, you got velocity, you got variety. 60 minutes of YouTube, a video is uploaded to YouTube every minute. 60 hours, I'm sorry, of, of video is uploaded every single minute. There's a phenomenal amount of data locked away. Some of it fun and comical, right? Some of it very informational and insightful. How do we get to that data, right? How do we get that information in a format that we can utilize it and make better decisions? Well, as I mentioned a moment ago, not surprising, organizations that are applying analytics, right, are simply outperforming their peers, right? They're 220% more likely to outperform if they have applied analytics. And analytics comes in a lot of forms, right? Analytics comes in descriptive forms, reporting and business intelligence, uh, dashboarding, scorecarding, uh, OLAP. It comes in predictive forms, as I talked about before with regard to the taxi cabs in Stockholm and Sweden. It comes in prescriptive forms where literally it's being brought forward, right, to the point of impact so line of business executives can use information to make better decisions right, as that decision needs to be made in real time. And in fact, a year ago when we asked organizations uh, about how important analytics is, right, a third of them said it's, it's a competitive differentiation. Within the past year, that jumped considerably. Over half of organizations today believe uh, analytics is a competitive advantage. A significant jump in the use of information and applying it towards optimal outcomes. So what does all this have to do with Watson? Well, Watson represents a new class of industry-specific analytical solutions. At its core is an analytical engine. Now, the way it operates is very different. In fact, if we look at IBM's history, we celebrated our 100th anniversary this year. 100 years ago, we were looking at the machines that did tabulation, punch cards. Uh, and these were, were, were important innovations. These were transformational in and of themselves. The census, which used to take years and years and years to tabulate, would be done in months, would be consolidated down to a, a, a matter of months. Much more useful, right, if you're trying to make decisions from that data. In the 50s, we saw the rise of programmatic systems. Many of us will remember languages like BASIC and FORTRAN, uh, Pascal or COBOL. Those have given way to more eloquent languages of Perl and C++ uh, and Java, but still very programmatic, the way we approach a problem you know, is in a systematic way that, that's built on a, a program-based approach. Well, what if we could evolve to that next generation? What if we could evolve to systems that weren't programmed? What if we could evolve to systems that were taught, right? Cognitive systems actually are that generation, a new generation of systems that aren't programmed, that are taught, that are able to understand and ingest massive amounts of data, to put it into proper context, Right? And then the learn, right? And the learning is a key component because with every iteration, with every outcome, these systems are capable of getting smarter. So what differentiates programmatic from cognitive systems? Let's take a look at a couple of the key elements. First, we've been talking about the use of big data. Traditional systems, legacy systems, typically reside on structured data. Zeros and ones and rows and columns and neatly formatted orders that are easy to decipher. Well, cognitive systems don't care, right? They can consume that unstructured information. And in fact, what's even more impressive, they can put meaning to the uncertainty of the unstructured information, right? So think about two sources of data. Think about medical data. We'll talk more about this. Think about one source being a, a journal article from a, a, a well-known publication, the other being a, a blog on a particular site. Both are useful, both can be insightful, they're not equally right, as applicable to a case. There's uncertainty in that information and bringing clarity to that uncertainty is part of what cognitive systems do. Next, they're, de they're not deterministic systems, they're probabilistic. So computers today are deterministic, two plus two. All of us in this room are thinking four. 
That's a deterministic answer. Probabilistic based systems say, well, it may be four, but I'm not sure. I'm 90% confident it's four, but two plus two could be a car configuration. Two front seats, two back seats. It could be a representation of a family unit, two parents, two children. If you Google four, two plus two, it'll tell you uh, that it's a poker strategy. So two plus two, which seems so obvious to us, has a number of meanings. And probabilistic systems weight those possible responses in the context of the question being asked. Uh, these are systems that are discovery-based, not search-based. So search-based systems, anybody here ever use Google? So the other day I was using Google and I got 4,144,000 responses. Uh, and I never get past the first page. And so what I do is I put a couple words in, I get to the first couple of, of responses. If it's not what I'm looking for, I go back and I start my search over. It's up to me to determine what's relevant. In discovery-based system, it brings back information that relevant, that's relevant. It does the work for me. And that's an important differentiator between deterministic and programmatic systems and probabilistic and cognitive-based systems. As I said, these are machines that are taught, they're not programmed. So how do we define cognitive computing? How do we define this new era? Um, Dr. John Kelly, who's our senior vice president and director of research, says cognitive computers are based on four key characteristics. One, uh, their ability to consume and ingest and work with big data. And I have to tell you, as a side note, I was corrected the other day by one of my colleagues. He said, Steve, you say that wrong. And I had to say, what do I say wrong? He goes, it's not big data, it's big data. Got to drop that voice. It's a lot of information. I said, I understand. I'll make sure I don't make that mistake again. Number two, these are systems right, that are based in statistical analytics. So when you ask a question or provide an input to Watson, one of the things that's happening under the covers is it's analyzing that information. It's weighting its response with the probable confidence that that response that's found to that particular question is accurate. That is statistical methodology at work. So these systems congest a lot of data, apply statistics, and they scale in. Now that's not a term we hear a lot about. We hear a lot about scaling down, Moore's law, things get smaller. We hear a lot about scaling up, more cores in a processor. We hear about scaling out, connectivity. What does scaling in mean? Scaling in means actually bringing the, the processor, the memory, the storage, all closer to the information, redu reducing latency. So these are systems that take a very different approach, very similar to an announcement we just made with our pure systems application, which are bringing everything together right, to make faster, more effective, uh, more insightful based decisions. And finally, these are systems that automate the workload. So they constantly adjust and refine themselves you know, based on the flow of information and the inquiry being asked. Well, like a lot of great ideas, Watson actually began in a pub. Group of folks sitting around, having a conversation. Everybody got up from the tables, right, and went over and watched the television. Uh, the, the show Jeopardy was on. And at that time, uh, there was an individual that was having the most successful uh, streak of winning streaks. Uh, the individual, Ken Jennings, had ultimately won 74 games in a row. Unprecedented. had never been done. And everybody in the bar went to see the game going on. And the group of IBMers said, what if a computer can do that? And that really was the genesis of the idea behind Watson. It began in late 2006, uh, and the game show aired in February of 2011. We didn't know at that time whether there was a commercial application for Watson or not. Right? That wasn't the intent. The intent was to prove a computer could do something. The byproduct clearly was that information-rich industries could benefit from the ability to decipher and understand information and begin to apply it in real time to make better decisions. We formed actually a division to commercialize Watson in August. In September, we announced our first customer and that we were moving into healthcare. And by December, we launched our first pilot. That pilot, which we're going to see in a minute in a video, um, is in a, an area of medicine where we're looking at the treatment protocols, the authorization of a particular treatment for a patient given a particular set of circumstances. Right? Today, that's a very time-consuming manual process one in which Watson can be the ultimate assistance. In March of this year, we announced uh, our second uh, application in healthcare, putting the Watson to work in oncology. Working with oncologists, trying to diagnose and treat cancer, starting with lung, 
moving to prostate and breast and, and so forth and so on over the course of years. Um, and we also announced at that time that we were moving into financial services. Again, information rich. We talked about 5 million trades per minute on the New York Stock Exchange, 9,000 pages of news data coming out every single day about the market. You know, the importance, maybe not life-threatening, of the decision right, on society. What a great place to apply this type of technology. Now, I always get the question from people that says, uh, what technology is Watson? Well, Watson isn't a technology. It's actually 41 subsystems in total. And in fact, it's not even new technology. The technologies in Watson have been around. They've been in the labs for years. Natural language. Now, natural language is not speech recognition. Speech recognition is relatively simple. We're used to it, voice-activated systems. We call an attendant today. It understands what we're saying. Natural language has the ability to navigate colloquialisms, idiosyncrasies, uniqueness of speech to truly understand what is being asked. The, the, the three characteristics that I like to reference when we talk about these 41 subsystems that really define are that natural language. The second is Watson's ability uh, to do what we call hypothesis generation and evaluation. Quite simply, it can take an input, a question, and it can break it down semantically and semantically into its subcomponents. All of us in this room asked to express a particular complex question would ask it slightly differently. What Watson does in breaking it down is it looks up for all the possible combinations of what is being asked, right, and then weights all those combinations against possible responses, right, and evaluates those responses in consideration of the original question to give the probable output. All of that's happening very quickly, but, but the most impressive part of a cognitive system like Watson is its ability to learn. Right? With each iteration, with each outcome, with each response, it's getting smarter. Now, you notice I used the word response. I didn't use the word answer. Watson doesn't have the answer. Watson is a humble genius. Right? It's capable of, of doing tremendous things with big data and understanding and applying. Um, but it's never so presumptuous to believe that there's only an answer. So think about medicine for a second. You go to a doctor, you're looking for a diagnosis, there's a, a possible combination of diagnosis. Maybe you have the flu, maybe it's something more serious. Don't you want all the possible uh, diagnoses to be considered and evaluated by your physician in making that ultimate determination? That is why Watson is really designed as the ultimate assistant to a doctor, to a banker, to a lawyer, and in other industries that are information rich and can benefit from having a system with these types of capabilities. So why is it so hard for computers right, to understand? Well, if we look at language, and it's really no different in, in French or German or Italian than it is in English, there are, are oddities that we as individuals don't even detect anymore. Right? For example, why do noses run but feet smell? It doesn't make sense for a computer. How can houses burn up as they burn down? These are things that traditionally have plagued systems. Or my favorite, which isn't on here, if a vegetarian eats vegetables, what does a humanitarian eat? These are very challenging language issues for a system. So imagine a, a simple question, uh, like who ran General Electric for this period of time? Now, if that information is stored away in a traditional database in a row and a column, it can quickly be retrieved and a response would be yielded. But what if that information is locked away in a narrative passage? A narrative passage such as, if leadership is an, uh, an art, then Jack Walsh surely has proven himself a master painter uh, uh, during his tenure at GE. If you take that statement literally, right, your conclusion would be Jack Walsh is a painter. Right? So the ability for a system to understand the inference and to extract the true meaning in and of itself is a significant feat, let alone its ability right, to, to, to navigate the potential other responses, weight them, and then learn. So whether Watson gets the response and the weighting correct or not, on the next iteration through, it's going to be that much smarter. So how does this all work? Uh, an input is presented, could be in the form of a question. right? That question could be presented in, in, a, in a multitude of ways. It, it could certainly be typed in. Uh, to a traditional keyboard or through a mobile device. 
Um, there is there's voice navigation uh, that, that's evolved so you could speak to it. Um, but that information is presented, it's analyzed, it's broken down. The hypothesis is generated about what the, the possible response is. They're evaluated against the evidence. Now, one of the things I mentioned at the beginning is Watson is industry specific. Well, I, I should have kept going. I should have said it's industry specific, use case specific. Because the information that derives a response is unique to that use case, right? Now, a use case may be uh, aligned to, uh, in medicine, to a particular type of disease. So when we talk about going to work in oncology and working in lung cancer, we're collecting information about lung cancer, research information. Right, journal articles, patient data, right? So everything is specific to the cause, right? So all of the evidence has to be collected and then Watson has to be trained, right? We call it curation of the data, where we're taking that information and we're telling Watson what that data physically means. We're, we're explaining right and wrong. Now there's a difference. Unlike my children who don't remember what they learned last year in school, Watson never forgets. So as it's taught, it's constantly building, it's constantly refining, it's constantly getting smarter. And what you can see here is a single input derives multiple responses, and those responses to, you know, in of itself you know, create these iterations of possibilities that are all being evaluated and weighed. And again, when Watson debuted, 200 million pages of information, three seconds. Right? So what you just witnessed on the screen is happening in real time as it relates to the response being generated. So we've talked a little bit about medicine. Uh, why medicine? I'm always asked, how did, uh, how did IBM pick healthcare as the first industry? Well, imagine an industry rich with information, where what's at stake literally is life and death, where inefficiencies abound, right, and, and waste is prevalent, right, and everybody's trying to do the right thing, and, and, and of course, you know, it's challenging. Medical information doubles every five years. So the average individual attending uh, medical school, by the time they enter to the time they complete their studies, right, information would have doubled. Virtually impossible for anyone to keep up. There was a survey done of physicians, and 81% uh, said they spent five hours or less every single month keeping up with periodicals. Well, when you start thinking about this in the context that one in five diagnoses are wrong, uh, it's, a, it's a daunting challenge. Next time you visit your physician and you're sitting there waiting and there's 10 people in the waiting room, realize that two out of 10 of you will be misdiagnosed. Right? That's a formidable challenge to put to work technology to make it better. And that's exactly why we picked healthcare as the first industry. I mentioned in December of 2011 we went to pilot. We went into a pilot with a company called WellPoint. Uh, you're going to hear from WellPoint in just a minute here. But they are an insurance provider, so they essentially pay for the medical treatments in America uh, that uh, one in nine Americans depend on. So they are the largest provider. They have a tremendous amount of information. And ultimately, what they wanted to do is ensure that they were acting in the best interest of their members, that their members, in fact, were receiving the proper treatment based on the information and evidence that was being presented. Well, they have 3,000 nurses every day evaluating right, a, about three cases an hour per nurse. That's over 15 million cases a year, right? You can imagine, right, the order of magnitude if you could, could consolidate that down and, and use a Watson as an assistant to that process. I don't know if you caught in there, he, had, he made a statement, only 55% of the medicine they practice is evidence-based, and that's, that's in their particular case. That's a little scary, since 45% of, the, of the, the medicine they practice is not evidence-based. And what we want to do is work with them to advance the information and evidence presented to a physician, right, to make truly an informed decision. So over the past year or so, we've been working diligently at commercializing uh, the applications themselves. We had to go from a purpose-built system to win a game show, right, to a hardened, stale, stable, scalable system, you know, capable of supporting commercial uh, industries. So we moved from a single user right, uh, if you will, the contestant that appeared on the game show, to thousands of concurrent users. We move from the ability to, to answer a question to a compound question. We move from being stateless, not remembering what happened before, to being stateful, right? Now, statefulness is critical, right? If I have a conversation with my physician, I want the system to remember what I said five minutes ago. In fact, I'd like it to remember what I said two weeks ago, and I'd like it to build upon that evidence, right, as it continues to, to um, uh, move forward and progress 
in providing better insights. So I want to take you on a journey here and show you what a Watson maybe will look like, an illustration, if you will, uh, of the Watson system um, and what it would appear to be in medicine. And has been referred to a, an oncologist. Now, this particular demo was done in cooperation with uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. If you're not familiar with Memorial Sloan Kettering, they are one of the foremost cancer centers in the world. Uh, they've been practicing the medicine of cancer for, for many, many decades now. And um, in one of the things that happens with Watson, I mentioned, it's industry specific, it's use case specific, and we work with uh, clinical experts in healthcare, or we work with financial experts uh, in banking uh, to ensure that the work that we do emanates and resonates with that industry, with that practitioner. Um, so in this particular case, uh, Mrs. Yamoto had been referred. Uh, the primary physician is going to get information uh, from that referring physician. Uh, they'll get that information in paper records. They'll get that information electronically, maybe a doc file, maybe a PDF file. Uh, in this case, what we're seeing here is it came out of an electronic medical record system. Uh, off to the right, we can see that the indication here was an abnormal chest x-ray. That's what triggered the referral in itself. And so what this oncologist is now going to do, it's going to ask Watson to take this information that's been presented and ingest that information about the patient, compare it to, to textbooks, to clinical articles, uh, to trial studies, to hospital information. Uh, and Watson is going to go ahead and pull that together and present back to that oncologist uh, a summary of its findings and recommendations. Now, ultimately, the oncologist will make a decision what the best course of treatment is. Now, in this case, we can see along the top here that Mrs. Yamato, uh, she's female, she's Asian, uh, relatively young. Uh, she has a mutation um, that they, they need to understand uh, the, uh, the significance of. And one of the byproducts of Watson is it knows what it doesn't have as well as what it does. So we can see on the bottom here, Watson is actually prompting the oncologist for additional input. It's looking for additional information uh, that would help it improve the confidence of its response. So the physician can see this. He hasn't uh, met with the patient yet. He'll take this into consideration. Uh, the other thing Watson will do, it will make a recommendation as, re as it relates to uh, the test options to consider. Now, in this case, uh, you'll notice that it's recommending a molecular pathology panel. Uh, the oncologist would agree, in fact, uh, what they would tell you is that what they're looking for, because Mrs. Yamato is Asian, female, and a non-smoker, uh, they're looking for a particular type of mutation. If that mutation was present, there's actually a pill that's 95% effective at curing that form of cancer. Uh, being tasked with, with understanding information that's doubling every five years. Not having sufficient time or resource you know, to ingest all the possible combinations of studies uh, that are coming out. 75 new clinical studies every single day in the U.S. alone. right? tremendous asset to have a resource like a Watson. Now, the same thing holds true in financial services, right? Same idea, lots of data, lots of information. In March of this year, we announced that we we're going to be working with Citi, right, at addressing problems in consumer banking. Uh, we are also working with other institutions on the uh, institutional side of banking. So we're working both from a consumer point of view, how to improve the experience, as well as from a trading point of view, how to improve the decision making. And it's substantiated by the fact that this industry has some significant challenges, right? Attrition rates are high, as they are with a lot of businesses. So how do I keep customers from, from leaving the bank? How do I get the customers to buy more products from me, right? How do I better serve the needs of those calling in for wealth management or financial services? And this is an industry that isn't afraid to spend over $400 billion in IT expenditure last year, right? They're constantly looking for ways to advance their organization you know, towards better outcomes. Now, the way Watson works, um, the architecture, if you will, is based on a data platform, the ability to ingest information, right, to collect, store, curate, and train Watson on that data. Uh, there's an analytical layer um, and capabilities that includes things like nano natural language processing and the algorithms that, if you will, drive the, the responses, the weighted responses we saw just a moment ago in the medical illustration with Mrs. Yamato. Uh, of course, the output itself, which can come in any form, could be presented through uh, an application like we just saw, um, or it could be presented through a, a data point in an existing application. 
the storage of this information, and then ultimately the top layer, which is what we call the Watson Advisor. So what you were looking at just a moment ago is a Watson Oncology Advisor. It's an application built with a specific purpose, in this case, um, to assist the physician and oncologist um, in a particular form of cancer. And those will continue to proliferate. In fact, one of the questions I always have is, um, can Watson be just put out there as a general service? And the answer is, of course, if it has sufficient time to collect and understand all of the potential information it would need to respond to, to general inquiries. Watson today is delivered as a service. In fact, it will continue to be delivered as a service. Now, the cloud is a popular thing, and certainly software as a service is something that we, we understand and, and, and appreciate. But there's really two significant reasons why, in this case, a service makes perfect sense, a cloud-based service makes perfect sense. Uh, first, we want to ensure that the technology in Watson becomes available around the world. We want to ensure that, that an oncologist uh, in the US or France uh, have that access as well as in Bangalore and Bangladesh, right? Not all parts of the world will have the sophistication as it relates to the infrastructure to support its own Watson, but if you present it through the cloud, through the internet as an offering, uh, it, it's really ubiquitous. And now everybody can access, everybody gets better outcomes. The second part, which is maybe more pervasive of an issue for us, is the fact that Watson is dependent on constantly learning. So one of the charters IBM has taken on is the collection of, of independent content, the licensing of information. So while a particular facility, a hospital or a doctor, has their information about patient and patient treatment and history, right, we also want to be collecting all those articles I referenced and all those research outcomes I referenced. If it's financial services, we want to be taking all the regulatory filings from companies and ingesting those, those annual reports, those those various filings that have, have multiple footnotes, and ensuring that the latest information is being put into the system. So as a service base, as a cloud-based offering, Watson has that ability. Now, it may be in the form of a public cloud or a private cloud. It most likely will be a hybrid. You know, medicine is a great example where there's a lot of information in the public domain that can be readily shared, but there's also information about the patient themselves that needs to be protected. And so the idea that information is housed in uh, disparate forms and formats, it's OK, right, relative to how this will ultimately be delivered. Now, where do organizations get started? You know, because clearly not everybody is, is ready for a Watson. And, and, and candidly, we're still learning. We're still evolving. We're in two industries today you know, with a handful of use cases. But what's interesting about this um, as we evaluated the hundreds of inquiries that we got immediately after Jeopardy, you know, we found some common themes. Organizations can improve the use of information, right? Just being able to collect unstructured data and put meaning to it through text analytics offered organizations much greater insight to things like consumer behavior, you know, or partner behavior, or supply chain optimization, or risk detection, or fraud mitigation, right? So the use of information is one step in the journey that organizations can take to prepare or get ready for a Watson. The application of analytics, starting to use predictive analytics. I can score propensities, propensities for customers to behave to a certain response, propensities for customers uh, to be fraudulent in action or nature. So the use of information, the use of analytics are building blocks all leading towards um, a, a full-scale Watson deployment. And we work with customers and we align them along five, five key criteria, you know, talking to them about you know, their industry and the nature of their business and how it works and our understanding of that industry, the use case right, or problem that they're trying to tackle. Right? We articulate the progression path as illustrated here from one to six, um, in this case of, of a journey an organization may take. Now what's nice is that every step, they're going to get a return on their investment. They're going to get a direct benefit. This isn't where you have to wait to the end of the story to ultimately reap the rewards. You know, through each iteration, companies will benefit, get smarter, uh, and use information more effectively. Um, you know, this has to align to an architectural uh, reference requirement, right? So things have to work together. Now, the good news is uh, all of that's advanced, right? And it just has to be addressed. It's really not a huge obstacle. Uh, and finally, um, the business model, the way in which we engage customers needs to be resolved. But the idea of being here uh, is that not everyone needs a Watson today, 
We're not in a position, if they did, to present everybody a Watson tomorrow, but we know that we can start a journey with organizations to take and advance both their use of information and analytics you know, towards a final Watson destination. We started in healthcare, we've gone to financial services. Uh, we don't talk a lot about it, but we're in government. You can readily suspect there's a lot of information and insights that can be gleaned uh, and, and really good things that come of governments using this information. Um, you know, we're looking at ways in which we may take this in a more horizontal fashion, you know, across areas like call centers and help desks and tech support stations. Um, and again, we're still in the early phases. We're still learning a lot about, you know, both how Watson as a commercialized offering will work, as well as what we need to do to bring it and advance it to its next stage. Thank you for your time this morning, and I think we have a couple minutes for questions and answer. Are cognitive systems the way to go to Web 3.0? Um, there, there's a, a, a huge social component of big data. So when we think about uh, Web 1.0, Web 2.0, uh, and where we're going, the use of, of uh, information, the use of social information, uh, advancements in um, you know, things like migrating to Web 3.0 are, are absolutely going to feed cognitive systems, right? So uh, they're mutually independent, but in, in the sense of how they operate, but mutually dependent in their ability to leverage uh, each other. Is Watson able to work on uh, multilingual data? Uh, today, Watson is based in English. Um, there's really two dimensions of, of the language question. Um, how it ingests information, right? So Watson's ability to semantically break down um, and, and work with language. Um, and then there is the uh, output or the input-output aspect of language. Today, it's all English. Those are different challenges, not formidable in, in, in uh, uh, technology, but certainly time-consuming in development. Right, so we, we took time to teach Watson how to interpret and navigate English. It will take time for Watson to interpret and navigate French. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to find that those two uh, language issues get separated downstream and the ingestion of information, which there's quite a bit of, of, uh, of English-based data there, is, uh, you know, is brought forward differently than the response. Obviously, converting uh, a response from Watson from English to French or English to Germany, um, you know, is a, a different undertaking. Um, from a timing perspective, it, it's going to be a little bit yet. You know, we're still building. Uh, we've just gone to commercial code on Watson. Um, so we moved off of the Jeopardy base to a commercialized base. Um, you know, the team working on this has grown substantially. And so language is probably one of the more frequent questions we have and it's certainly something that's on the roadmap to address. Okay. So terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you.